Welcome to Married to History, where we try to be informative, entertaining, and family-friendly. Aloha! I'm Christopher. I have a fancy piece of paper on my wall that says that I know more about history than most people do. I'm Shirley. I'm a homeschool mom that relies on good curriculum, Christopher, and Annie the Musical to teach our kids history. I'm surprised you didn't say gangly orphan Jess. Before we get into our episode, let's take a minute to talk about something from a past episode. It's important to keep in mind that Shirley does not warn me about our topic beforehand. And oh, I try so hard to get it out of her some way, somehow, yep. but she doesn't give up. Yep. It's fun for me to see what he knows right off the top of his head. And that means sometimes we miss things. If you would like to hear a more comprehensive and well-prepared episode on any topic, just let us know. So, honey, what have we learned since last time? Uh, I don't remember what am I supposed to be talking about. Is this where I'm supposed to be talking about the cavalry? Or yeah, so it? I found that oh, article okay. for you about oh. about Tiger Warriors. All right, so yes, uh, we uh, I believe we mentioned a while ago, uh, we talked about the five Tiger Generals of uh, Shu during the Romance of the Three Kingdoms period. Uh-huh. So Shirley showed me an article uh, about the history of Tiger Warriors in China, uh, and I must confess, I did not read the whole thing. I started reading you it last night. You didn't do your homework. I thought, homework? I'm the teacher. I'm not a student. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't even make my You're own students student. do homework. I don't believe in homework. I know there's probably a lot of teachers out there who, if they're listening, they're going to probably say, what? That's a but tangent. No, I totally don't believe in homework. I think homework but is ridiculous. But you are a student of history. I, I thought I'm you a would student read of it. history. And I was reading it, but like I said, I was reading it late at night, and I was getting <laughs> tired, and I started to kind of doze, so I put it down, figured, all right, I'll get back to it later. It is later, but I haven't gotten back to it yet. That's fine. So but what anyway, did you learn? Among the things that I thought was rather cool was apparently no, in, uh, throughout China's history, there have been periods of time where warriors have war, or, or either soldiers, infantry soldiers, or even on occasions cavalry soldiers, have worn tiger skins as uh, clothing or as, as kind of an armor or a disguise, if you will. A disguise? The, the kinds that I mentioned. So first off, if we didn't make this clear... Tigers are revered in Chinese culture. They are symbols of all manner of awesome things. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why there's that uh, kind of uh, the, the the romance of it about a tiger warrior. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some people. The uh, one of the ar the article had a picture of at least one guy who was actually wearing like a tiger skin suit. It looked kind of like a set of pajamas almost to me, <laughs> like a onesie. Um, but yeah, and the the idea of it, I believe, or at least that I got from the article, for the most part, was kind of an intimidation factor. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that I read about it. So again, this has been done several times throughout history. There have been warriors that have been called tiger warriors, or there have been warriors that have donned tiger units. Um, I believe tiger, this tiger article. Outfits. I believe this article was specifically about the Qing dynasty. Q I N G. So it wasn't specifically about the Qing. It started off okay. specifically referring to a unit during the Qing Got dynasty, it. which was the last of the Chinese dynasties, if I'm remembering correctly. That then these guys did wear these tiger skins uh, mm -hmm. as part of their. I, I don't know if you would want to call it uniform, disguise, armor, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. But uh, the one that I found most interesting, because I remember I had once upon a time read at least one reference to uh, tiger units being uh, the name that was given to a particular cavalry unit right. at some point in Chinese history. Um, and I found uh, in the article, I remember one of the things that I read before I dozed off, uh, <laughs> was there apparently were times where some Chinese cavalry units would throw tiger skins over their horses. Okay. And so that way, when they charged into battle against the enemy cavalry, uh -huh. the enemy cavalry horses, horses aren't terribly bright creatures, yeah. they see tiger skins coming at Seriously? them. So their horses freak out, and their cavalry is just but out, of, out of action. How do... Okay, so I put a tiger skin on my horse. Mm -hmm. How does that not scare your horse? You're on my same team. Are our horses just trained to not be scared of these tiger skins? I suppose that is one possibility. Another possibility might be blinders. Like, even today, we put yeah. little things over horses' eyes so that they can't see to the right or to the or left like of them. Extracted. So they can only see, like, what's in front of them. Yeah. It's, impo it's entirely possible that they were training because, uh, unless I'm mistaken, most horses aren't the type of animals I mean, by their nature that should be willing to ride off into warfare. Right. But through training... Mankind right. has been able to get them to do this from time to time. 
So I imagine training was part of it. Uh, I imagine they could have used blinders or something else to hmm. make it so that not their own cavalry units wouldn't get uh, distracted by such a thing. So, I don't know. Cool. It's also possible that, uh, from the horse's perspective, I'm just thinking about this one off the top of my head. Maybe you should have read the article. If two horses are right <laughs> next to each other and one has a tiger skin over it, perhaps there's enough for the uh, horse that's right next mm-hmm. to your horse to tell, oh, that's just a horse wearing a tiger skin. <laughs> but if you are running towards each other super fast yeah. and you're still very far away, you probably would notice the tiger stripes yeah. coming at you before just about anything else. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Also, I mean, seriously, like if I'm thinking right now, <laughs> if I'm looking at, let's say that there's somebody mm-hmm. a whole football field away from me, he's so he's on the far end of a football mm-hmm. field, and he's wearing tiger pajamas. Okay. I am probably gonna see that guy, and it's probably gonna take me a while, especially if I'm running at him, he's running at me, for me to realize, okay, that's not actually a tiger. This is some <laughs> dude wearing a tiger suit. But if I'm standing right next to that yeah. guy, it's like. That's a lazy pair of pajamas you got there, man. Well, I guess I shouldn't say lazy. It's not, no. Odd. It's, no, now that I say that's kind of mean of me. It's kind of cool, tiger skin pajamas. Right. <laughs> I'm not condoning the skinning of tigers to make pajamas. No, especially Don't not now. I, I would imagine back then when these tiger warriors were around, they uh, they weren't worried about the extinction of the tiger species the way we are today. I doubt that very seriously, yes. I don't think extinction of species was high on people's minds. Um, Yeah. Okay, there was a couple other things really quick that you had mentioned this week to me. You looked up something about when the Ottoman Empire started that you wanted to clarify. Oh, so yes, I I want to... I don't remember when I said it was. I think I speculated that the Ottoman Empire had started around about the time of the Renaissance, so probably about the 1500s or so. Mm-hmm. So no, I was reading up, uh, surprisingly enough, I was actually reading about catapults at the time, <laughs> and that segued into eventually getting into the Ottoman Empire. Uh-huh. Uh, but no, okay, so it started sooner than I recall at the time. The Ottoman Empire started around about the 1200s. Dang, that's a big difference. And so you had asked me about the Ottoman Empire because yeah. of that furniture. Yeah. So I... I wanted to point this out. Ottoman is not, or the Ottoman Empire is named after its first emperor, whose name was, and I might be pronouncing this wrong, yeah. whose name was Osman. So O S M A N oh. kind of sound. But Ottoman is the European right. way of saying it. And so that's where it gets named. And I was right about something else I said. So um, the, the Turks, the Ottoman mm-hmm. Turks, they were not from Turkey. They were not a Mesopotamian people. Where were people. they originally from? They were from deeper in Asia, if I remember correctly, somewhere closer to Afghanistan. Oh. And they came into the area, mm-hmm. which they, they were able to have some early successes into the area, thanks in large part to the weakening of other areas because of the Crusades, amongst other things. Right. And they did not take power at first. They... Um, they showed up like right before the Mongols did, Genghis Khan's Mongols. Oh. So they got conquered like everybody else yeah. in the area. But then after the Mongols retreated, went back home to their own, and the, the Mongol Empire falls apart, mm-hmm. the Ottomans are the ones that resurge and end up taking power. And yeah, they have the largest of the Islamic empires that was ever established. The, okay. the, um, at its height, the Ottoman Empire extends all the way into North Africa and even Spain. Okay. Cool. Yes. And final little thing before we get into our main topic. Um, You said something about when the Renaissance started in relation to the Crusades. Uh, so, um, I remember a long time ago, uh, the idea was put into my head either because of something, a uh, discussion I had, uh, professors or something that I read, that the Fourth Crusade was a direct influencer of the Renaissance. Right. But then when I was reading, amongst other things, because of the, uh, the, the, the trail. Yeah, and the took catapults. Because the, uh, so the, the, in talking about the Ottoman Empire and the catapults, I'm, talk, I'm also reading about the siege of uh, Constantinople. Uh-huh. So I also came across that. Oh, okay, so the Fourth Crusade, though, is also earlier than I, than I anticipated. The Fourth Crusade happens in the 1200s. Uh-huh. So that's a 300-year gap in between the Fourth Crusade yeah. and the traditional beginning of the Renaissance that historians would trace it to. So you so were that's wrong. too far of a gap. Yes. <laughs> it's this, a big gap. Th- th- this will happen from time to time, especially if you're catching me <laughs> off guard with questions that I, um, I'm going back on my memory of right. what I've learned or what I know about these things. And believe it or not, 
Historians get things wrong from time to time. Never. We get, we get things wrong from time to time. This is why I like conversations. Because if I don't know as much about something as somebody else does, I want that conversation because I want to get that person's insights. Mm-hmm. I'm so, so anyway, sorry that I don't but, know no, and but, I can't, can't correct you so, in real time. <laughs> but I want to be clear about something. So, despite the fact that historians largely say that the Renaissance begins about the 1500s, uh-huh. there were proto-Renaissances, if you will. There were other things, other events, other... Uh, flares, seasons, if you will, Mm -hmm. that would lead up to an eventual, the big thing, the Renaissance. Right. And some of those proto-Renaissances do trace back far enough so that you could say that, all right, this does Uh, actually match up with the time when the Fourth Crusaders would have been returning to Italy, because Venice got a lot of the stuff that came out of the Fourth Crusade sacking of Constantinople. And I knew that the Renaissance, quote, started in Italy. Like, I feel like I've heard that before. Okay, so that's where it started then. So, and then it grew. So yes, it's not as, so it would seem that it's not as big of an influence mm-hmm. on the Renaissance as I was led to believe, but it was still an important feature that allowed the Renaissance to come into being. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. Anything else? I don't know. Did I tell you anything else? That's all I have written down. All right. Um, uh. I remember there were, uh, I think the record for the longest uh, trebuchet launching of a, of a pumpkin uh, was, <laughs> well, I, I want to say it was somewhere close to half a mile, but I don't That's remember. A lot. I, can, I read that one several days ago, so I don't remember yeah. how, remembering that part right. <laughs> uh, other than that, I don't remember reading about anything that we've talked about on the show recently. Okay, so I have something different for today. Uh oh. Instead of my standard silly question, um, do you remember Kindergarten Cop with the governator, Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yes, I do remember Kindergarten Cop. He had that point in the, in the show, in the movie, where he asked the kids, who's your daddy and what does he do? Remember okay, that scene? Okay, yes, I, I remember love that, that scene. scene. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, who's this dude and why is he on your poster? So for okay. context, <laughs> so for context for say, everyone. Why are we going to be talking about my daddy and his job no. on this show? My dad, I love my dad, but he's got a boring <laughs> job. Well, he's retired he's now, retired but when now. he wasn't retired, he had a boring job. I'm sure he would disagree. He worked with numbers. I find numbers boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, so when you graduated from your teaching credential program, we had yes. a big party for you. Yes. I made this poster. Yes. And it says at the top, we all knew you could do it. Yes. And then I printed out a bunch of little wallet-sized pictures of, like I told you to tell me who were your favorite historical figures. Mm-hmm. And then everyone at the party wrote their name on one of those pictures. Mm-hmm. So it's like all these people from history and all these people from your life. Knew you could do it, kid. So we have that poster. So who's this guy and why is he on your poster? All right, so I'm not sure for certain who that guy is off the top of my head. Based on the beard, he's somebody from Mesopotamia, Persian era. So I'm going to guess that that is either Darius, Xerxes, or Gilgamesh. See how he's holding the little lion cub? I am seeing how he's holding the little lion cub. I'm going to go with Gilgamesh. It is Gilgamesh. So who is Gilgamesh, and why do you like him? I like Gilgamesh because he is, uh, I, I like to describe him as the first comic book hero, the first superhero. <laughs> okay. So I, I, yeah, I shouldn't be comic book hero, but the first superhero. Yeah. So unless something has changed without me, uh, without me uh, having heard any rumor about it, Gilgamesh or the Epic of Gilgamesh, I believe is the oldest piece of writing or at least the oldest tale, the oldest story mm-hmm. of writing that we have found thus far, or at least that we are also able to read or we're able to translate and understand. Yeah. So it tells the story of a king. We don't know for sure whether or not this was a uh, inspired by a real man at some point mm-hmm. in time, or if this was completely a work of fiction, or uh, one could argue that it can't be completely factually true because there's monsters <laughs> and whatnot in it. Well, you know, folk tale. Was it? Did it begin as a true story? Yeah. Or, yeah. So anyway, it's, it's a cool story. Gilgamesh is a mighty king. There are several different tales about him, I recall. I don't know mm-hmm. if there's a uniformity. 
because I don't know that I've ever actually read the original tales. I've only read secondary sources yeah. on that. I'm, I've never gotten a hold of the actual whatever <laughs> it was that we got the story oh, out of. Oh, that's not one that I found. Documents or whatnot. No, that's not <laughs> one that you found yet. I did. So. Hold on. Years ago, when I was teaching the kids about Gilgamesh, we found this really cool picture book at the library. Mm -hmm. Beautiful art. So that definitely wasn't a primary source. But yeah, it's a cool story. So yes, I, I doubt that I know all the ins and outs of the story. It's been a long time since I read about it. And you mm -hmm. love teasing me because there's a character in one of the stories yep. whose name that I remembered wrong. And to yep. this day, I still say it wrong. Yep. But I know who I'm talking about, so I'm cool with that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Gilgamesh... Gilgamesh is a king. Uh, for a time, he's not a very good king. The people don't like mm -hmm. him, but he has some life experiences that kind of force him to have a change of heart, kind of see the error of his ways. Uh, this happens, if I'm remembering correctly, because he meets a man, a wild man named Ankidu. Uh -huh. And Ankidu is kind of a rebel against him, or rather the anti-Gilgamesh when Gilgamesh was in his bad days. Ankidu represents the things that Gilgamesh is doing wrong. And mm -hmm. so the two of them have a fight. But at the end of this fight, they become friends. Both of them form this bond. Gilgamesh realizes the error of his ways in that. And they go on to have several adventures together. So, um, sorry, before you tell us about the adventures, I have to point out, is this where the whole idea of, like, if two guys are mad at each other, they just need to punch each other, and then they'll be best friends, they'll move on? Rather, you know, opposed to women where we scheme and we talk about each other behind our back. Like, those stereotypes... Is that where it began? All the way back in ancient Mesopotamia? So, I don't know about the women scheming part. Uh, I'm not a woman. I'm not going to say that I understand <laughs> women all that well. I don't I, either. I, I, I married one so that I wouldn't have to understand them. I would yeah. have one that could just translate everything for me. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, yes. I, I do not know if that's... I, I would be willing to bet that no, the tale of Gilgamesh... You keep hitting my hand. I, I'm sorry. I, you I, can't I, hit I tap, the table. I, I tap things with my <laughs> hand sometimes. Uh, oh, so I cannot say that this story is where mm -hmm. that idea of, yeah, guys just need to like punch each other a couple times. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they're best friends. I'm willing to bet that no, that idea of guys just being able to like hit each other around a bit and then mm -hmm. becoming best friends. Probably predates the story, and the story <laughs> was taking that yeah. that known truth or that observed truth, and they put mm -hmm. it into the story as well. Ridiculous. Yes. Uh, Anyways, they go on adventures. <laughs> so, so yes, Ankito and Gilgamesh go on some adventures. Among them, I do not remember the description of the monster, but on one occasion, they go and fight a monster. I believe it's a bull of that some kind. Right. Um, and uh, in this battle, though, Ankidu is mortally wounded. No. And Gilgamesh is heartbroken. Gilgamesh, not just heartbroken because his friend is dead, but Gilgamesh suddenly gets, like, super scared. He's mm -hmm. afraid of death. Yeah. Doesn't know what that means, doesn't know what that... Th this is one of the reasons why the Epic of Gilgamesh is still really good for us today. Yeah. Because it still deals with things that we deal with today. The fear of death, what right. comes next the problems of losing loved ones that we care about, forming friendships, mm -hmm. forming bonds that will last forever. Yeah. These are these are all still things that we talk about today. So Gilgamesh is timeless. definitely still a, a timeless story. Yeah, a good epic for people to read today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew at some earlier point in time before I got to college about this much of Gilgamesh and Ankidu's story. Okay. Then in one of my first uh, college classes... Um, we had a professor in one of my classes who, <laughs> oh man, she was interesting. <laughs> she, she had some very interesting theories that I enjoyed listening yeah. to these theories and entertaining some of them. But? But I've never taught any of her theories <laughs> in my classes or to my students. Um, okay. So anyway, uh, we're in her class and uh, she gives me this assigned reading which is a section of Gilgamesh's epic that, uh, prior to that point, I had never read before. Got it. Um, so I'm reading this point in time, and this is after uh, Ankidu has died. Gilgamesh goes on a quest. Mm -hmm. He's scared of death. He wants to find out what's next. Or actually, if I remember correctly, his primary goal is he wants to avoid dying. He wants right. to be free of it so that it can't get him. So the best way to do that is to go on a dangerous quest in parts unknown where you most definitely will die. We can't have this big of a pause. Oh, you can't okay. just stare at me. I, 
Sure. I, I, I was kind of... I'm just saying his I logic would... isn't necessarily the most sound. Couldn't he have sent a messenger to go find the Fountain of Youth and bring it back to him? You're talking about things that I haven't said yet, so who's telling the story You here? said he was going to go on a quest to, you know, avoid death or figure out how he can avoid death. I said death. that he was looking for ways, he was thinking about ways. I hadn't described he anything that he was done, done yet. Okay, it was implied, and I know the story, so spoiler. Yeah, you're, you're, okay. you're spoiling. Okay, you're okay ahead spoiler. Of I'm just saying he should have maybe stayed at home in his palace, led his people, and commissioned some dude to find eternal life for him. I suppose that's Because the world is dangerous, and you can't leave your front door, but or he's else you might die. He's the Superman of his day! Okay, fair. What's he supposed to do? Say, hey, Batman, go find something for me. But he couldn't stop Ankito from dying, so he's not, like, invincible, all-powerful. Have you ever read a Superman comic or no, seen I any of the Superman movies? I don't think I have. People die in those, and Superman wasn't able to not stop that. It yeah. didn't change the fact that he was still Superman. Okay. Go ahead. All right, so, like I said. Like you said. He's all hung up on this dying thing. And some way, somehow, I don't remember if somebody tells him or he reads about it, whatever the case is, mm -hmm. he hears about a man whose name that I'm going to say wrong. Do it. Uh, that, no, I, th I think I can say it right okay. this time. So the wrong way that I have always uh -huh. said his name is Utanipsim. Uh -huh. I believe the correct pronunciation, or at least a better pronunciation of it, is actually Utnipishtim. There you go, Utnipishtim. That's what Google told me is the correct translation. All right. And anyway, he finds this guy's name, and it's delivered to him or given to him with the idea that this is the one man mm -hmm. who was granted immortality by the gods. Cool. So Gilgamesh says, like, all right, this is what I got to do. I got to find this guy. Mm -hmm. I got to ask him, how did you do this? What did you do? So that Gilgamesh can find out what he must do right. so that the gods will give him the same reward. Mm -hmm. So he tracks it down. Or I, I, I don't remember what all the perils or whatnot there might have been <laughs> in between him. Eventually, he does find Utnapishtim. Very good. And, thank you. <laughs> and he asks Utnapishtim the questions, like, well, what did you do? How did you do this? Yeah. And this was the part that I really, really loved because I'm like, oh! I, I love encountering things yeah. like this. So Utnapishtim tells him, no, you, you misunderstand. Mm -hmm. I was not granted immortality mm -hmm. uh, in this life. I was granted immortality in the next life uh. because I was commanded by the gods. And I, I'm, I'm trying to the best of my memory remember the way that the story yeah. told it. Uh, Utnapishtim tells him, I was granted this reward by the gods because... Uh, I don't remember the exact words, but basically the message is this. Because I built a boat mm -hmm. and put two of every animal mm -hmm. on this boat and thus preserved the species of animals on our world right. from the flood. In that sounds Gil familiar. In Gilgamesh's time, at least everything that I remember reading or hearing across everything that I've studied with history and every professor or whatnot that I've ever had on the matter, mm -hmm. one of the things that I really, really like is that all of the ancient ones that we are aware of, they yeah. all say there was a flood. Yeah, the whole concept of the flood myth being so, like, you see it across all these different cultures is fascinating. Yes. So... And uh, if this account is to be believed, it mm -hmm. would seem that uh, Gilgamesh met who most of the rest of the world would call, or at least most of the rest of the world that I know of, would mm -hmm. call Noah. Yeah. And so I thought that was totally cool. And that matches up with what we know, at least about uh, the Judeo-Christian stories about yeah. Noah as well. Noah did this thing. He built the ark. He saved the animals. And the yeah. idea is that in the Judeo-Christian, and I should, I should be including Islam into this as well because... Um, uh, Muslims believe in Noah too. Uh -huh. That idea that yeah, he's going to be have eternal life in the afterlife right. because of these things that he did. Right. So Gilgamesh walks away from this kind of disappointed because Noah's basically told him, okay, well you've misunderstood. You yeah. are going to die, and ain't nothing you can do. And there's really no way for Gilgamesh to like track down God and say, or the gods and say, hey, uh, can I, can I build a boat too and you uh, flood, flood the earth again? <laughs> yeah, let's do like this that. again. 
But if I remember correctly, despite the fact that Gilgamesh does not get what he's looking for, here again mm -hmm. is an excellent version of the story, at least for, uh, for continuing generations today. He's not depressed. He's not all like, oh, mm -hmm. woe is me, or oh, there's no point yeah. in living, or whatnot. Despair. He takes that message that Noah gives him and is no longer afraid of death. Noah basically has right. convinced him that death is something that happens, dude, and there is a next world. Mm -hmm. Where, amongst other things, Gilgamesh expects that he will be able to be with his friend on Kidu again. Aww. So yeah, I, th I thought that was a really cool story. And it was actually at that point when I read that. So yeah. if, if we haven't made this clear yet, uh, we, we are Christians ourselves. <laughs> yes. We believe in uh, the Christian theology. Mm -hmm. So we believe, that no we believe in that Noah was real. We believe that he really did build this boat. We believe that he really did have the animals on it. Yeah. And since... I believe that Noah was a real mm -hmm. person. This, to my mind, yeah. gives me just a little bit of an inkling, a little bit of a hope that indeed the Epic of Gilgamesh is based right. on a real person. I love the idea that Gilgamesh may indeed have been a real person. He may have indeed been a real king mm -hmm. who had, if not all the experiences in the Epic, who may yeah. have sincerely wanted to know how to not die. And just as the New Testament has stories in it of people approaching christ and asking him yeah. how can we not die it makes perfect sense to me that this real man this real king might have mm -hmm. tracked it down in noah in his day and asked him how can i not die that is very cool yeah so yes i, I love and and for those of you who are interested gilgamesh has tons and tons of references across many different cultural platforms really? to this day so a couple off the top of my head, I know the story about Gilgamesh and Ankidu is yeah. told by Picard in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Seriously? <laughs> yes, I, um, I know that Gilgamesh is a playable character in a couple versions of the civiliza of Sid Meier's Civilization right. games. Right, right. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think I've ever really cared for playing as him, though. I, 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 I'm not always liked the city thing. If, I don't actually Superhero? Know, I, you I don't think like I liked him. him in Civilizations Four. But I don't yeah. think I liked him in, the, in uh, the others that I've seen him in. In fact, maybe I've only seen him in one other. Anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> and um, I know that he also, made, he and Ankidu, but Ankidu was depicted as a wolf in this one. Oh. He and Ankidu made an appearance in one of the Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy XII, if I remember really? correctly. They were, uh, if I remember correctly, they were a not plot critical side quest that okay. you can encounter. And oh my goodness, they were tough to defeat. There well, are probably other you said they were are, superheroes. There are probably other people that are listening saying, what are you talking about? You're a <laughs> sissy at that game. I was able to defeat him easily. It took me a while right, to defeat right. him. To defeat them. Did you kill Ankito? Uh, if I remember correctly, I had to kill him first because <gasps> to try to kill the both of them together is impossible. So that I went for him first. That was very nice of you. My guess is that he must have been healing Gilgamesh. That's probably why I went for him first, so that he would stop healing Gilgamesh so that I could defeat him. <laughs> Right. Yes. Um, and I want to say that there are others too, but those are the only three I can think of off the top of my head now. Yeah. So yeah, Gilgamesh. It's a good story. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend you track it down and read it because it's a pretty cool story. And maybe you will encounter some of the better parts of the story that I have forgotten since. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think you did get me a book in Epic of Gilgamesh because that seems familiar to me. I know I found you a translation of Beowulf. And you have the Odyssey and the Iliad. Maybe Beowulf is what I'm thinking of then. Yeah. Hmm. All right, I guess I'll have to look that up later. I could find you that picture book from the library if you want to read that. Yes, because I would so much rather read a picture book for children about Gilgamesh than to read, like, you know, a scholarly <laughs> work. But the art was beautiful. I'm sure it was. And it wasn't like Dr. Seuss-like type book. It, it, I mean, there was a lot of words on each page. It was a lot. <laughs> it wasn't just like one sentence. Turn the page. Like it, they didn't. Was they, it a pop up book? Also, it, was, it wasn't a pop up book. I'm just saying they didn't um, abridge it as much as I, you I could can see it for now. children. It's a pop up, and you pull the little tab, and on keto <laughs> and uh, Gilgamesh take turns punching each other. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> No, you need to do that. You need to make that book I need happen. to make a pop-up book. I haven't been able to, make to make write happen. my own book. <laughs> I take that back. I wrote my own book. I just wasn't able to market it. Yep. So maybe I'll get that done, and then I'll uh, I'll try to make a pop-up pop -up book, book about Gilgamesh for kids. Yeah. No, it'll be a pop-up book about Gilgamesh for adults. 
<laughs> Adults love pop-up books too. Why not? I don't remember the last time I saw a pop-up book. I mean, I've seen them more recently than you, probably. Yeah, it's probably because you spend more time with the kids than I do. I do. Mm-hmm. And not just our kids, because our kids are too big for pop-up books yeah, too. And my students aren't kids anymore. Do you remember when our youngest, when Cortis was little, like a year or two old, we had that Ocean Animals pop-up book? And he was terrified of it. I do not recall this. Oh, you don't remember? He w- He's a sensitive soul. He's he's just very sensitive. Another word for that used to be sissy. It's oh, not you a can't bad... say sissy anymore. No, because that's offensive. And it's, it's not a bad thing that he's so sensitive. But it was very funny <laughs> that he was terrified of this ocean pop-up book. To be clear, we love our son. The point was, pop-up books are scary when you're a year old. <laughs> Lots of things are scary when you're a year old. But it's but yeah, it's all about personality. We've seen. I remember some of our kids. I would throw them up in the air, mm-hmm. and they lo- number three. You loved it when I yep. threw them up in the air. Number one and number four. I don't remember number two, but number one, and number four. Yeah. They hated it when I threw them up in the air. Yep, because they're more sensitive and emotional. It's not a bad. They thing. were one. <laughs> yeah, they're they're more risk averse. Is what thought it that is. One year olds can be sensitive and emotional. <laughs> they're risk averse. Well, I wasn't number three. Because cause Tertius is going to... He's told me that we are way off topic. He's told me that he wants to go skydiving. Okay. I told him he can't until he's 25. You realize that he can actually do it earlier than that and you won't be able I to stop know, him. I know, but I... I have to try and convince him to wait until he's 25 because, because after it's he's safer when you're 25. No, but after he's 25, maybe he, once his prefrontal cortex is fully developed. Oh, there we go. Maybe okay. at that point he'll go, that was a stupid idea. I'm not going to jump out of a plane. It is safe. Ish. Far more people die in traffic accidents than skydiving yeah, accidents. The Though granted, at the same time, a lot, a lot more people drive cars than yeah, skydive. Yeah, yeah. You have to look at percentages. It doesn't matter. It's something that I've thought about doing for once or twice, but I'm, I'm afraid Please of heights, don't. so I'll never do it. Yeah. I'm a, you know I won't do it. I'm afraid of heights. I, I couldn't know. even go bungee jumping that one time. The closest I ever got to bungee jumping, I think I actually got within 150 feet of the bungee jumping platform oh my gosh. at the state fair. Oh my gosh. It wasn't even off a bridge. It was at the it was fair. Stuff like a tower yeah. at the fair or something. Yeah, yeah, I think that was the closest I ever got to bungee jumping. <laughs> I, I I believe that I was within 150 feet of that thing. That's impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Tertius wants to jump out of the plane. I don't think I got in the line. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, do you have anything else <laughs> to tell us about Gilgamesh and why you thought he was so awesome that he had to be immortalized on a poster on your wall? He's one of my favorite characters because I love the distinction about it. I love that you can be an imperfect person and you mm-hmm. have time to change your ways to come back to be something better. I love that he made a friend out of an enemy. I love that he had an enduring friendship with this guy. I get the sadness of losing a friend. I've lost more than a couple of friends in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. I miss a lot of them very terribly. Not all of them are dead, but they've been lost yeah. in that. They've There's broken off contact or disappeared some way, somehow. I have no idea what's going on with them. I have my religious beliefs that I will be mm-hmm. able to see them again yeah. in the next life, but who knows how long of a wait that's going to be. I'm kind yeah. of impatient sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, and I think it's really cool the idea that dude might have met Noah and mm-hmm. sat down and talked with Noah. How cool is that? That is cool. Well, and oh, sorry, and then the last part, and that when yeah. even when he did face that disappointment, he didn't just throw everything down, throw himself on the he floor, and kick and scream and whine and say, "Oh, it's not worth living anymore." That's what I would do. He went back to his people, and I would hope at least lived out a good long life as a good king afterwards. Ep- uh, so pictures of him haven't been destroyed. All mm-hmm. records of him haven't been destroyed. So I'm inclined to believe that if he was a real person at any point in time, yeah. he must have ended his days as a good king. Or else the people would have taken more, or the people at the time would have taken more care in destroying every example that he ever existed. That is a good point. Or at least point. everything that didn't didn't uh, outline that he was only a villain. That is a good point. But how much of the art that we have about him was ri- was made like centuries after? Because of the story, not because of the man. Well, but again, the idea, though, is that that stuff existed to inspire people centuries after to make yeah. new rounds of art and whatnot yeah. if there hadn't been anything to create that. True. Or if there hadn't been... 
if anything at the time that told the Epic of Gilgamesh as anything but a bad guy, yeah. then, or sorry, as anything but a good guy, then that wouldn't have been survived. That odds are that would have been destroyed by the people at the time. Because people True. don't usually hesitate to destroy monuments and things to things that are wicked. I say usually hesitate. There's plenty of argument for today that there are plenty of people that are hesitating to destroy things that are bad. Right. Well, let's stop there. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, then please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a five-star review. If you'd like to hear a future episode with more information about how today's topic... About how... About today's topic, I can read. Do you know how to read? Contact, I can read. Contact us on Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Married to History Pod. Also, please contact us if you have a silly question idea or if there's something from history that you would love to learn about. Just be sure to specify in your message if it's silly or serious because we don't want to treat a genuine quest for knowledge as a joke. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next time. That's not what the script said. It is. That's went what, off script. That's why I hesitated because I was like, that's not what I was supposed to say. It felt weird. But I'm proud of you. I kept saying it anyways. I'm proud of you. Uh, you, need, you need to improv more often. Nope. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, then we'll get into Is this into a show? Our... Is that what I call it? Yes. A show? Yes. Podcasts are still called shows? Okay. Yes. We're not going to call it a pod or a cast. We could. Or a, it's a pod. Or a, no, or a, what, what, what do you call it? A peas in a pod? No, that doesn't what? make any sense. Yeah, you, you need to stop me because I'm just going to keep stop you. on and on and on. So let's get into our main topic. Oh yeah, that's right. We haven't okay. even got to a main topic yet. No, we have not. Oh my goodness, 15 minutes and we're not even on the main topic yet? Yep. Hey, hey, hey. Yep, oh were. wait, but that's 15 minutes counting our, our warm-up time and our yes. time for you. Yes. So turn the mic Either way, on. you were okay. long-winded today. Okay, so... I tend to get that way when people ask me history questions, because history is awesome! History is awesome. History is awesome. History is awesome.